June 6, 1996, 2.30 a.m., Rowlett, Texas, an upscale neighborhood outside of Dallas. One operators receive a disturbing call. Police find six-year-old Devin Routier and his five-year-old brother, Damon, stabbed to death on the living room floor. Their 26-year-old mother, Dolly Routier, is alive but bleeding profusely from multiple stab wounds and a gash across her throat. Her husband, Darren, is unharmed but in severe shock. The couple's third child, Drake, only seven months old, is found safe upstairs in his crib. Darlie's rushed to the hospital. Despite massive bleeding, doctors are able to save her life. With a grisly double murder on their hands and the community in panic, detectives frantically search for the killer. 11 days later, the police announced that Darley Rotier has been arrested for the ruthless, cold-blooded killing of her own two children. After only a single day of deliberations, she's found guilty and sentenced to death by lethal injection. For over 10 years, Rotier has maintained her innocence, claiming that she and her children had been attacked during a botched robbery, and that the real killer is still out there. My name is Jerry Pallas. I'm a private investigator and former detective with the New York City Police Department. This is the transcript, the uh, part that they blacked out. Mm -hmm. Court TV has asked me and my partner, former NYPD homicide detective Reggie Britt, to investigate. This is, this is really one way, this testimony. The case became big news and erupted into a media circus. The question on everyone's mind, could a mother really have done something like this to her own children? Established the time of death between 1.30 and 2 a.m. You got to look at what did he base the uh, time of death on. Did he testify at the trial? Before heading down to Dallas, we read through the transcripts, police records, and other court documents in our New York City office. But successful investigations aren't about documents and records. The truth isn't in the folders. It's in the eyes of the people who know what really happened. down here very seriously oh in Texas, God. but this is not the place to commit a murder, because you're going to go meet your maker for sure. At the time of the murders, Darley's husband, Darren, was upstairs asleep, their third son in a nearby crib. Darren told investigators that when he heard his wife scream, he jumped out of bed and ran downstairs, assuming that an attacker was in the house. He's been a controversial figure ever since. Some say he was involved in the crime. Can you take us back to that night, June 6th, 1996? And we were all watching TV downstairs, and Darlene had popped some popcorn and everything. Well, the boys went upstairs and got their blankets and their pillows, and it all lay down on the floor. And me and Darlie talked, you know, about different things. So. I went up back upstairs, and it was probably, you know, 11 o'clock or so, after the news, probably, and uh, climbed into bed and went to sleep. And the next thing I hear was this glass break, like, you know, but far away. Mm -hmm. And then I hear Darley just screaming, you know, Darren, 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 Darren. I mean, just freaking out. I mean, you know, yeah, I jarred me, and, you know, I jumped up. I run down the stairs as fast as I can. I looked up, I'm yelling at her, what the hell happened? You know, she grabs the phone, she's running back and forth. I'm trying to give Devin CPR, and I, as soon as I blow into his mouth, I mean, air just comes out of his chest. Jesus Christ. I didn't know what to do, you know? I mean, you know, you're just, you're just freaking. I mean, right. just trying to do everything that you can, trying to logically think about what just happened and then you're, you know, and all you can do is just sit there on the curb and watch your whole life just be gone. Now, Rowland is this little town, right? A small little town. Yeah. Nothing like this ever happened. A stranger came in at my house. A stranger came in. And killed my kids. 
took my kids and almost took my wife. And if Darlie had died, I'd be on death row. You would be. With this police department, that's exactly true. Because yeah. the truth has nothing to do with it. Somebody had to be responsible for it. Did the police question you as a suspect? Did you think that they thought you were a suspect? I think I was so stupid, I didn't even think that they thought that it was a possibility. Well, how did you feel when they arrested your wife? Devastated. And in shock. And wanting to prove that they were wrong. You say you didn't realize she was hurt until you came back in the house? Right. Is that true? Yeah. What did you say to her then? You remember? I made her a promise. When I helped her get on the gurney, I made her a promise that I would find out who did this. She asked you for that? Right, yeah. She, she said? Because she didn't think she's going to make it. Really? Well, I didn't. What did, what did she say to you that you promised her that? What did she say? Do you remember her words? She said, I want you to promise me that you find out who did this and take care of it. I was looking at him and looking into his eyes, realizing just how much he's still in love with his wife. Yeah. And when he talked about those boys, he's suffering. <laughs> at her trial, Dolly's defense attorney relied on evidence found at the house, which he argued pointed towards an attempted break-in, but the jury didn't buy it. got one more, one more appeal about her DNA. That's what the unknown male, there was an unknown male's uh, DNA found? Yeah. They did elimination and uh, some unknown male and they haven't been able to put a name to that. Now, Darley's lawyers claim that the cops missed critical forensic evidence, including a bloody fingerprint that contained unknown male DNA. Steve Cooper heads up Darley's new defense team. The state's theory was that uh, Darley Lynn uh, murdered her sons, then staged the crime scene, and then uh, inflicted the wounds on herself. But we have a couple of things that match to an intruder that only, for instance, this bloody fingerprint. Uh, then we can paint a picture that would demonstrate that, in fact, there was a non-family member uh, in the house that night. This is all new evidence, this Correct. basically, right? And it wasn't in the record at all. No. The improvements in DNA testing in 10 years is just incredible. Well, if Dolly Lynn didn't do it, then who did or why? I think it's quite likely that it was a burglary uh, attempt, and somebody wasn't expecting to find an adult and two children on the living room floor at 3 o'clock in the morning. But this is a crime that went terribly wrong, right? I believe so. I think it's the most likely uh, probability. The state's case was entirely circumstantial and mostly in involving around character assassination. Wanting to claim that these children were in her way and she was just this uh, large-breasted, blonde-haired, you know, floozy in, in um, a Dallas suburb who was, you know, trying to get rid of these bothersome kids. How confident do you feel at uh, the courts may give you this. I mean, we're in the state of Texas where um, uh, we like to kill people. And our courts um, uh, uphold the vast majority of death sentences. You're looking at the evidence. Uh, there's some fingerprint evidence there that, that doesn't match right. anybody. Right, then the, uh, the, supposedly the intruders could have been a setup for a burglary or something like yeah. that. The burglary that went real bad. It's all circumstantial. She really doesn't have a motive. What's her motive? That's the possibility that she might be the wrong person. So far, the picture being painted for us wasn't pretty. No motive, outdated DNA testing, and new evidence that, if true, pointed to an unknown male intruder. But three weeks into our investigation, We'd already spent more time looking into this case than the original detectives had. And at this point, we had serious doubts if Dolly Rotier was the right person. Hi, this is uh, Jerry Palace from Court TV. Uh, if you could please give me a call. We were trying to get in touch with the detectives who had been involved with the case. We wanted to know what they had to say about the new DNA evidence 
that pointed to a male perpetrator. The neighbors, this is direct line for them. But so far, we weren't having much luck finding them. It must be a small department. When investigators first arrived on the scene, they found Darley bleeding from wounds to her arms and neck, screaming hysterically that someone had broken into her home and killed her two sons. A search of the residence found nothing missing, but the police did find the murder weapon, a knife from Rotier's own kitchen. Then, something puzzling. In an alley, almost a football field's distance from the house, lay one of her husband's socks, splattered with spots of blood later identified as belonging to their two murdered sons. From all our years on the force, Reggie and I had come across some strange pieces of evidence, but this one stumped us. It just didn't make any sense. Could there have been an intruder? Man, it could have been an intruder. The only thing I don't like about it, as far as the intruder theory goes, is the fact that somebody broke in, goes in there to commit some sort of burglary, kills two kids, nearly kills the mother, and leaves, and 75 yards away, down an alley, is a sock, is a sock belonging to the husband that had some blood on it. At trial, the prosecution set out to prove that Dolly had murdered her two boys, ransacked the living room so it would look like a break-in, doused one of her husband's socks in blood from both of her dead sons, ran down an alley to plant the sock, then came back, stabbed her arm with a knife, used the same knife to slash her own throat, then called 911. 